Maybe start uh, two or three minutes uh, into the hour. Yeah, just give me the sign. Well, you're live on uh, on YouTube. Uh, I uh, jumped the gun. Don't say anything naughty. <laughs> And Alan, maybe we, we can tell everyone that whoever's not speaking should mute themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I think we can start now. Okay, uh, I'm Alan Freeman. Can I welcome you to this seminar or webinar on fascism and to welcome our illustrious speakers and all of you. Just a couple of housekeeping points before we start. Please make sure that you're muted so that your own uh, background noise doesn't interfere uh, with what's happening on the screen. So I shall start without more ado. Canada has a fascism problem. Therefore, the US and the UK have a fascism problem. Therefore, the West has a fascism problem. To many young people, fascism happened long ago, or it's just a term of abuse. Having lived through the death of Stephen Lawrence and four other racist murders in my own neighborhood in London, organized by fat local fascists only 20 years ago. I can assure you from personal experience, fascism is not just alive, but deadly. Events in Cuddly Canada show it is not only alive, but in a relationship with Western governments that should be brought to light, debated out, and put a stop to. That's what makes this webinar especially important. Canada has a fascism problem. On September the 23rd this year, Anthony Rota, Speaker of the House, saluted Yaroslav Hunka or Hunka in the House of Commons as follows. Yaroslav Hunka is a war veteran from the Second World War who fought for Ukrainian independence against the Russians. He is a Ukrainian hero and a Canadian hero, and we thank him. Every single member of the House rose to give Hunka a standing ovation. Hunka joined the 14th Waffen Grenadier Division, also known as the 1st Galician Division of Nazi Germany's Waffen SS during the Second World War. This was a volunteer unit. He was not compelled to do it. 
It was charged with anti-partisan reprisals in Poland, Slovakia, and on the Austria-Slovenia border. It was responsible for the deaths, the Nuremberg tribunals confirmed, of over 150,000 Polish, Polish and Jewish civilians, uncounted number of Romas, and is notorious for atrocities which include wholesale massacres of unarmed civilians. Sergei Shoigu, Russia's Minister of Defense, is submitting evidence to Interpol that Hancock was personally and directly involved in these crimes and has requested his ex extradition. In response to a question that Radiga Desai put to P Putin of President Putin of Russia, he gave a famous reply. If the Speaker of the Canadian Parliament says that this Canadian Ukrainian fought against the Russians during World War II, he can't help but realize he fought on Hitler's side. Assuming he doesn't know, and I don't want to hurt the feelings of the Canadian people, we treat Canada with respect. But if he doesn't know that Hitler and his minions fought against Russia during the war, then he's an idiot. It, but this might just mean he didn't go to school. But if he knows that this man fought on Hitler's side and calls him a hero of Canada, he's a bastard. Now, actually, the Russian term Yegodnyai is better translated as scoundrels, but perhaps the interpreter's emotions got the better of him. So this is the translation that has become famous. Rota, whether he was an idiot or a bastard, fell on his sword and resigned. But the problem caused by his decision and the reaction of our elected representative has not gone away. Canada has a truth problem. Radica was interviewed first by Briar Stewart, who reported Krista Freeland's response, where she acknowledged the terrible mistake of honoring Hunker, but urged, Canada, urged Canadians to be aware of how effective Vladimir Putin is at weaponizing that mistake. You cannot weaponize truth. Truth is its own weapon. Freeland's message is that truth stands in the way of a narrative. In short, it makes it harder to lie. This is not just a moral problem. The West fools itself with its own lies. It lives in a bubble. It doesn't even understand why the BRICS, the G77 or the United Nations are turning against it, or we even grasp that it's losing a real war in which it's sending hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians to deaths in a proxy war for its own selfish ends in vain. Canada has a credibility problem. James Turk, director for the Centre for Free Expression at Toronto Metropolitan University, says what the Prime Minister did is a step in the right direction. This is Trudeau apologising. To make clear this wasn't an action of the government of Canada, that the government of Canada is deeply embarrassed. Well, we can't deny the government is embarrassed, but to say this was not an action of the government is simply not serious. The Speaker was elected by the House. He represents the House at the highest level. The government is responsible for his actions in detail, not just in general. If the government wishes to restore its credibility, it should face the truth and ask how this mistake was made. We don't even have an answer to such elementary questions. Is as is Rota an idiot or a bastard? Did he know? Canada's fascist past goes way back. This was reported to the Deschain Committee in the 19 Commission in the 1980s. It's the only country in the world that acquitted a war criminal on the grounds that he was only following orders in a volunteer unit. And from then on, has neither investigated nor prosecuted any of the 200 or more names reported to it by Jewish and Polish organizations seeking justice. That's why we need a detailed and public inquiry. That's the least we should expect. Canada has a blind eye problem. Professor Norton, on the 29th of December, four days after the last report I've cited, says it's unclear what the procedure was as to why this is why Rota did it. When it comes to vetting guests, nor that the process is equally murky. Staff might have had access to an RCMP database, but it's more likely they would check out guests in the same way everyday people do. Does Norton read? Is this a trustworthy source? Why in the CBC's elective, allegedly objective reporting does it systematically turn to sources like these instead of speaking to the many Ukrainians in Canada who do not support their government, or let's say it loud, to Russians in this country and in Russia itself. That's a true job of a journalist, not retailing narratives. We have reliable information 
from people within the Veterans Association who have written supporting us that the uh, security forces in the House of Commons are obliged to report five days beforehand to the Speaker regarding any security problems of any guests. The difficulty with reconciling that with the view that Rota is merely an idiot is quite difficult. Canada has a freedom problem. When we arrived in our, uh, back from our Valdai Club meeting in Canada, we were interrogated for three hours by customs officials. They had clearly been briefed on issues which had nothing to do with customs violations. Following the relatively balanced interview with CBC's Briar Stewart, there was a further interview of Radhika with CBC's Karen Paul. The interview was hostile and essentially accused her of moral and possibly legal violations. It relied, it relied on unchecked testimony of sources such as the above and from Canada's so-called counterintelligence community purporting to represent Ukrainian opinion. No effort was made to contact the many Ukrainian people and organizations who strongly differ. CBC is just part, therefore party to a smear campaign, smear, the purpose of which was to suppress those who dissent and those who dare do what is actually necessary uh, to frustrate the most important single step necessary to end the slaughter now underway dialogue. So, last week's Economist contained an interview with a leading Ukrainian spokesperson, where it was openly admitted that the Zelensky government has a special entity responsible for overseas assassinations. Tatarsky and Daria Dugin are its best known victims, but last week saw the firebombing in Madrid of a prominent member of Ukraine's opposition in exile. The notorious Miro Dvoryets website contains a list of so-called enemies of Ukraine, providing a public signal to the state, to the state terrorist forces along with paramilitary forces throughout the world as to who constitutes legitimate targets. Canada's security services should not be persecuting academics who do the job they're paid to do, seeking out truth and stimulating dialogue. They should be tracking down state-sponsored murderers. To sum up, Canada has a fascism problem. When the government, the security services and the media conspire together to hide the truth about its fascist fascists, its own complicity in the past and the present with their crimes, and to suppress those who speak truth to power, it is no longer entitled to call itself a home of freedom. I have great pleasure first in introducing Gabriel Rockhill, founding director of the Critical Theory Workshop, or the Atelier de Théorie Critique, who is professor of philosophy at Villanova University and the author or editor of nine books, as well as numerous scholarly and public articles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. It is a pleasure to be part of this panel with so many of the uh, leading intellectuals who have worked on fascism and from whom I've learned an enormous amount. It's also a pleasure to collaborate insofar as I'm the director of the Critical Theory Workshop with the IMG. I look forward to other collaborations like this in the future, and I'll share in the chat after my comments the call for paper or call for applications for our summer school. My comments today are entitled Fascism, the Cutting Edge of Imperialism. In order to understand how fascism operates as a form of political management under capitalism, it is essential to undertake a dialectical analysis of the relationship between fascist ideologies and the economic base. The definition proposed in the theses of the 13th Executive Committee of the Communist International Plenum of December 1933 and made famous by George Dimitrov is perfectly in line with this orientation. Quote, fascism is the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary, most chauvinist, and most imperialist elements of finance capital, end quote. We see here a clear-eyed understanding of how fascism, far from simply being a set of morally reprehensible ideas or actions, is ultimately grounded in imperialism. Driven by the economic base and funded by the most reactionary elements of the capitalist ruling class, fascism often seeks to mobilize certain sectors of the civilian population, primarily the petty bourgeoisie and the lumpen proletariat, and state forces in a process of national renewal via the intensification of imperialism and the radicalization of capitalism's colonial legacy. In the interwar period, it was characterized, among other things, by the violent expansion of imperialism on the part of the European latecomers to the colonial feast, Italy and Germany, as well as the imperial emergence of Japan in the East. 
I'm going to share with you my intertitles just to mark where we're headed. So interwar fascism and imperialism. Italy, in order to secure access to cheap natural resources and labor pools, as well as markets, undertook a project of imperial expansion. By the outbreak of the First World War, it had already annexed Eritrea and Somalia, and it had wrested control of regions like modern-day Libya away from the Ottoman Empire. Mussolini's government undertook to increase the size of the Italian Empire, which it did by continuing to expand the borders of its colonies and forcibly seizing Ethiopia, Abyssinia, and modern-day Albania. This process continued at the outbreak of the Second World War with fascist Italy's invasion of Greece and Yugoslavia. In the East, the Empire of the Rising Sun annexed various Manchuria and various regions in China, and it also took over Taiwan and turned Korea into a colony. Japan continued to expand its empire across Southeast Asia through the onset of the Second World War. The Nazi expansion across Europe is well known, but it is less, wide, less widely acknowledged that its colonial undertaking in the East against the Soviet Union was modeled on the US's settler colonial project and its expansion to the West. Just as the United States had genocidally eliminated the indigenous population and sequestered survivors on reservations, Nazi Germany planned to use what it had learned about the dark arts of genocide in Europe against the Slavs in the East. According to Mikhail Rom's 1965 documentary film, Triumph Over Violence, the six million sent to gas chambers in Europe was the warm-up routine for what was to be the elimination of 60 million people across the Soviet Union. The Nazis' imperial drive was not only for Lebensraum in the East, it was also, crucially, to eliminate the greatest enemy of imperialism, actually existing socialism. This, of course, is one of the major reasons why major segments of the capitalist ruling class financially back Hitler. I'll reference Jack Powell's excellent book on this topic uh, since he's on the call and we'll share, hear from him shortly. Next section, defeat and redeployment. One of the greatest ironies of the 20th century was that bourgeois democracies like those in the United Kingdom and the United States were compelled to ally with the Reds in the USSR in order to fend off Germany's bid to become the leading imperialist power by engulfing the former world leaders in imperialism, as well as Japan's attempt in the East to wrest control away from the West. It was the Reds who ultimately defeated the fascists, and all anti-fascists have an enormous debt to the 27 million Soviets and the 20 million Chinese who gave their fascism, we should never forget, was ultimately defeated by communism, since the heart of the Second World War was fought in the East. With the routing of Germany, Italy, and Japan, as well as the destruction of the former imperialist powers in Western Europe, the US emerged as the new leader of the imperialist camp. While its cultural apparatus projected an image of it as the leader of the free world, its national security state discreetly set about integrating fascists from around the world into a veritable imperialist international. To cite but a few revealing examples, the head of the Nazi intelligence service directed against the Soviets, Reinhard Galen, was recruited by the OSS and then continued under the CIA after the war and then put in charge of the West German intelligence service, where he proceeded to hire thousands of his fellow Nazis. Ivanik Donuel explained this strategy with remarkable clarity. Quote, it is hard to understand that as early as 1945, the army and the US intelligence services recruited without qualms former Nazi criminals. The equation was, however, very simple at the time. The United States had just defeated the Nazis with the help of the Soviets. They henceforth planned to defeat the Soviets with the help of former Nazis, end quote. This included bringing 1,600 Nazi scientists to the United States in Operation Paperclip, providing safe passage for some 10,000 other Nazis to the United States, stocking stay-behind armies across Europe with Nazis in and Italian fascists in Operation Gladio, and running many through rat lines to Latin America to support US-backed dictatorships across the region. I've detailed this in a long article uh, on the topic if anyone wants uh, additional references in that regard. The same basic pattern that we saw in Nazi Germany is also visible in Italy, as attested to by Operation Sunrise and the CIA's recruitment of figures like the Black Prince, Valerio Borghese, to continue the fascist war on communism. In the case of Imperial Japan, its leaders were largely put right back in power by the United States. As the undisputed overseer of global imperialism, the US enlisted this international network of right-wing militants in its ongoing war on communism and its efforts to expand its imperium through the proliferation of dirty wars, 
terrorist and torture campaigns, concentration camps, and dictatorial regimes around the world. Victor Marchetti, a senior CIA official from 1955 to 1969, described the centrality of fascists to empire building in the following terms, quote, we, meaning the CIA, were supporting every half-assed dictator, military junta, oligarchy that existed in the third world, as long as they promised to somehow maintain the status quo, which would of course be beneficial to US geopolitical interests, military interests, big business interests, and other special interests, end quote. The contemporary cutting edge of imperialism. Fascism has, at least in a certain sense, served as the cutting edge of imperialism, meaning the frontline struggle to expand empire and beat back socialist resistance, often through violent forms of so-called primitive accumulation. Form of political management, when the drive for endless expansion encounters limits or threats thereof, including its own systemic crises of realization, socialism, and the power of organized labor. With this in mind, let us briefly consider two contemporary conflicts in order to see what light this insight can shed on them, Ukraine and Israel. According to the bourgeois concept of fascism, which dominates the mainstream media, neither of these could be considered fascist, either for culturalist reasons or because they maintain a semblance of bourgeois democracy as hollowed out as it is. In the case of Ukraine, liberals often assert that it cannot because of President Zelensky's Jewish heritage. They thereby confuse the of certain fascist ideologies, anti-Semitism, with the universal form of fascism. However, fascism can have very different ideological contents depending on the circumstances, and these should not distract us from its general form. In the case of Ukraine, we have a government that has worked hand in glove with fascist militias that explicitly identify with the Banderite tradition of Nazi, Nazi collaboration, these militias have played a key role in fighting the Russian separatists in the Donbass, who declared a nation in reaction to the 2014 fascist Maidan coup fomented by the United States. In its ongoing efforts to quash this anti-fascist movement, the Zelensky government has banned political parties, thrown opposition leaders and communists in prison, control of the media, worked closely with fascist militias and integrated some of their forces into the National Guard, glorified ultranationalists and Nazi collaborators, empowered of fascism and postponed elections. The primary force propelling the Donbass region and Russia is above and beyond Ukrainian oligarchs like Ihor Kolomyovsky, the United States, which is using Ukraine as a proxy in its war against Russia and ultimately China. Although Russia is, of course, a capitalist country, it has pursued an autonomous path as of late refusing to follow the dictates of the US Imperium and instead asserting an agenda of national development along with a foreign policy uh, along with foreign policy interests that conflict with Washington this means in short that it has created a number of obstacles to the development of US imperialism in this regard the fascist developments in Ukraine in its war against Russia can be seen as part of an attempt to expand imperialism and beat back oppositional forces it is precisely because the US has branded its imperial expansion as the spread of democracy, that the very idea that fascism might be at work in Ukraine has been mainstream Western media. Regarding Israel, the might be fascist or that fascist elements could be operative in the country is often considered in the West to be a logical impossibility because it is a Jewish state. The specific content of fascist ideologies varies considerably, however, and anti-Semitism or white supremacy, to take but two examples, are not requirements. In fact, these are only specific types of dehumanization, but there are plenty of others for different target populations. It is helpful in this regard to invoke Domenico Lusordo's important distinction between naturalistic despecification and moral, despec moral or political despecification. Both of these processes occur in moments of acute crisis. They involve, Lusordo explained, the exclusion or expulsion of particular ethnic social or political groups from the valued community, the properly civilized group, even the human race, end quote. De specificazione in Italian has the connotation of an exclusion from the species. The Third Reich, identifying its enemy as an entire race or people, relied on naturalistic despecification, which dominated the colonial tradition that it sought to resume and radicalize 
In the Soviet Union, by contrast, quoting Lesordo, despecification was invariably political, moral, not racial. Forced labor was not a hereditary condition, end quote. Exclusion from the community was based on moral and political choices, not purportedly unchangeable natural characteristics like race, religion, nationality, or ethnicity. Given what I briefly outlined, and I'm going to shortly conclude or uh, soon conclude, uh, regarding fascism's roots in the colonial uh, project of expansion and the role it has often played as the cutting edge of imperialism, it is worth recalling that the Zionist movement that eventually led to the founding of Israel was explicitly conceived of as a colonial project. Theodore Herzl, the movement's preeminent leader, liaised with the racist symbol of British colonialism, colonialism Cecil Rhodes, about quote unquote, something colonial, namely his project to use religion as a real estate deed to dispossess Palestinians. The Zionists received extensive backing by major forces in finance capital like the Rothschild oil and banking interests, and they secured the support of major imperialist powers. In return for their backing, they were guaranteed that the new state would serve their interests. Given Israel's geostrategic location and proximity to major oil and gas reserves, it was of great importance to the leading imperialist countries, and it also served as a geostrategic wedge against pan-Arab socialism. If we look at Israel's current assault on Gaza and the positions taken by the Israeli government, it is impar imperative to ask a question that has largely been excluded from mainstream Western media accounts. Is this a case of naturalistic despecification as a justification for colonial? The Israeli president, Isaac Herzog, has stated, quote, it is an entire that is responsible. It's not true, this rhetoric about civilians not being aware, not involved. It's absolutely not true. We will fight until we break their backbone, end quote. The failure to distinguish between combatants and civilians is a war crime, according to international law. Nevertheless, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant ordered a complete siege of Gaza in a clear act of collective punishment. Quote, no electricity, no food, no water, no fuel. Everything will be closed. We are fighting against human animals, end quote. Israeli army reservist Ezra Yachin understood his government's position perfectly well and harangued his fellow soldiers to, quote, erase them, their families, mothers, and children. These animals can no longer live. Every Jew with a weapon should go out and kill them. If you have an Arab neighbor, don't wait, go to his home and shoot him, end quote. Yachin, who is 95, has been touted in the Western press as Israel's oldest reservist. He has been around long enough to have had the remarkable record of having sought to ally not once, but twice with Hitler's Germany in order to have Nazi backing for his Zionist project of colonizing Palestine. As journalist Dan Cohen explained, Yachin, quote, was a member of the Lehi, the Zionist terrorist group that twice attempted to ally with Nazi Germany and sought to found a copycat fascist state, end quote. Uh, I don't have time to kind of get in and answer the question that I've raised, but it should, I think, give us all something to think about in reflecting on the relationship between fascism and imperialism in the current moment. And just to conclude, in order to understand the last century of fascism, it's imperative to situate it in relationship to imperialism. And although both of these phenomena are multifaceted, I hope it is now clear that at least one of the roles that fascism has played over the course of the last 100 years has been to serve as the cutting edge of imperialism meaning the frontline war for its violent expansion and the beating back of socialism. It is a tool of political management under capitalism that is regularly deployed in order to subdue those populations that refuse to acquiesce to imperialism. While there are many tactics for fighting it, there's only one clear strategy, which consists in overcoming capitalism that is the driving force behind um, fascism and establishing socialism. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. And I wish to just now go straight to the introduction of our next speaker, Radhika Desai, who I've of course already mentioned, but here is a very important part of her background. She's professor of department, professor in the Department of Political Studies in the University of Manitoba. And there she is the director of the Geopolitical Economy Research Group. She is the convener of the International Manifesto Group 
And her books include Capitalism, Coronavirus, and War, A Geopolitical Economy, that was 1923, the book Geopolitical Economy After U.S. Hegemony, Globalization, and Empire in 2013, and Slouching Towards Ayodhya, From Congress to Hindutva in Indian Politics in, 19, in 2004, finally Intellectuals and Socialism, colon, Social Democrats and the Labour Party in 1994, which was the New Statesman and Society Book of the Month. So Radhika, over to you. Uh, okay, first of all, uh, thanks very much, Alan. And let me say, it's uh, I, I thought when we organized this, that this was going to be a really exciting panel and Gabriel's uh, presentation uh, certainly uh, uh, vindicates that expectation. And I hope that uh, I will stand up to the very high standard that he has set. So I've been thinking a lot about fascism. And the reason is the, there are several reasons. One is my work on the new right and the history of right-wing politics more generally which is a field of study in which I kind of cut my intellectual teeth, so to speak. Then I've gone on to work on uh, Hindu nationalism or Hindutva or what we may call the Indian version of fascism. Um, uh, and and, and uh, I've, I've been one of the small band of people who has insisted on using the uh, comparison or the, the paradigm of fascism in understanding the uh, the politics of the Sangh Parivar, as it is called, the family of organizations to which today's ruling party, the Bharatiya Janata Party of uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, belongs. And I've just finished a piece uh, uh, in which I try to understand uh, or I try to show that uh, Modi's relations with corporate capital and his whole modus operandi within India today is is remarkably similar to that of Hitler uh, uh, and Hitler's relationship to the corporate capitalist class of the time, a venture in which once again, I'll, I'll also gesture to Jacques Power's book, um, Big Business and Hitler. Um, was very helpful. So I've been doing that. And then finally, I've written a great deal about the history of capitalism as contradictory value production, uh, which includes a discussion, all essentially includes a discussion of the type of political and state action that has been necessary historically to stabilize capitalism and indeed save capitalism in previous centuries. From this work, there are some important points that I feel I would like to emphasize today vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, the discussion that take place in trying to understand both fascism of the past, the continuities between that and fascism today, which I think Gabriel has uh, discussed brilliantly, uh, and then, of course, the, the forms in which we see fascism re-emerging today. So the first point I want to make is that fascism must be absolutely separated from the Holocaust. That is to say, uh, because the Holocaust was one very important result of it, but by uh, by, by essentially equating fascism with such an enormity, we completely forget that even before the concentration camps were created, even before 1939, fascism was dangerous, deadly, authoritarian, uh, and essentially uh, 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 something that we must oppose. So I think that's, so the idea that somehow fascism equals exterminism uh, is, is wrong. And also, of course, it completely misunderstands the political economy uh, of the macabre form of labor exploitation, which went wrong and resulted in the mass uh, uh, mass extermination of, of Jew, Jewish people, but also many others, minorities, Poles, communists, et cetera, et cetera. As Arno Meyer particularly has argued in his very important book, Why Did the Heavens Not Darken? It also tends to read backwards. It looks at the results, not at the dynamics that led to those results. And it forgets that there was fascism, as I said, before the concentration camps. Uh, secondly, I'd like to involve, uh, insist that these dynamics centrally involve imperialism and competitive imperialism. Um, others, of course, Gabriel has talked a lot about it, uh, but one of the key issues uh, uh, or one of the key things that uh, this scholarship has brought out is that what was particularly shocking about fascism uh, in Europe uh, was that it brought methods of war and subjugation that had been reserved for the colonies into Europe. The third thing I want to point out is that fascism is often treated as entirely separate from the rest of right-wing politics, but this is not so. As Hobsbawm has emphasized in his um, 
uh, uh, the age of extremes, fascism was part of a wider rise of the right in Europe, which included a whole range of regi regimes. So fascism was sort of like the hard edge of this form of this right wing resurgence. And uh, fascism cannot, uh, and, and, and this is also related to the fact that fascism cannot and has never taken power without the connivance of liberal and conservative forces, which may initially regard fascism with distaste, particularly because of the plebeian origins of many fascist leaders and, and, and followers for that matter, but eventually decide to throw in their lot with, uh, with them. At a, at a critical point in, a, in the evolution of the crisis that brings fascism to power. And in relation uh, and in connection to imperialism also, it is important, and I think Gabriel already alluded to this, but it is interesting that fascism in its strongest forms have emerged in the, precisely in the comparative imperialist have not countries. Now, the fourth point I want to therefore uh, talk about is what exactly is fascism? Um, I hear uh, find Nikos, Nikos Poulantzas' approach interesting in considering it as an exceptional form of bourgeois politics, but there are other exceptional forms of bourgeois politics. There are dictatorships and military dictatorships, for example. Uh, so how are, is fascism different from that? And it seems to me from everything that I've uh, read and, 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 and thought about that the distinctive thing about fascism is is that it relies on the mobilization of parastate violence because ordinary existing the apparatuses of state repression, the state official state apparatuses of repression either are not or are considered not to be sufficient for the purposes of the repression that is considered necessary. So if you take this seriously, it also be, makes sense uh, that uh, uh, why, for example, the, uh, how social, the, the social background of fascists is always different from that of the elite that employs them, which leads them to have a certain contempt of the elite, has a certain contempt for the, these plebeian uh, uh, people who are the fascists. But, and it also then is used, this sort of contempt is used to falsely exonerate conservative and liberal elites who eventually do ally with fascists and who uh, instrumentalize fascists. Secondly, it makes sense of the fact that the requirements of these forces uh, for requirements of legit legitimation, for example, often take forms that may be considered base by the elites. And, and of course, these requirements may also diverge from what the elites who have instrumentalized fascists may require out of that. And eventually there may even be conflict as a certain at, as became clear at a certain stage when, for example, Hitler continued to expand uh, the war, even though many German capitalists realized that this would be wrong. Uh, this would not be very fruitful. And finally, the, con uh, the there is always the ever present possibility that the control of the elites over the fascists who they are using may slip. There is always the element of the in this relationship of who rides the tiger dare not dismount. There's always the danger of what these fascist forces represent often for the elites themselves. So, uh, so one can say that therefore fascism should be seen as an exceptional form of bourgeois politics, uh, which combines, which emerges at the confluence of the rise of mass politics, which is why fascism is a form of authoritarian politics, which must mobilize the masses in some ways, however, falsely and crudely and, and, and so on, and however fraudulently. Uh, so the rise of mass politics on the one hand and monopoly capitalism on the other, which represents an even greater concentration of economic power and political power. So the contradiction between these two trends over time only gets sharper. So today we are witnessing a resurgence of fascism, and inevitably, in the uh, in the face of the of the historical experience of fascism, there is a considerable elite discourse about uh, uh, you know uh, as as uh, as Alan particularly has pointed out about how our governments are supporting Nazis in Ukraine. Actually, Gabriel also talked about this, and uh, and so on. Uh, and of course, in the Indian context, there has been the ever present debate about the fascist character of the Hindutva forces. So 
Now, among these various discourses that are now kind of becoming very, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, very prevalent, one such inter one intervention is that by Alberto Toscano, who is a who has just written a new book called Late Fascism. And I want to focus a little bit on this because I want to em emphasize the manner in which certain sections of those people who who claim that they are leftists are actually busy muddying the waters of our understanding of fascism. So Toscano, on the one hand, and does not deny the rise of fascism. But on the other hand, he engages in a series of intellectual contortions whose aim is to suppress the only sort of opposition that can be to fascism, only sort of effective opposition that can be to fascism, which is a class-based socialist politics. So let's take a closer look. Toscano begins with a list of instances where everyone, uh, uh, where he claims that you know everybody and their dog likes to call those they abhor politically fascists. And it seems to me that practically everybody who begins by uh, saying this, in my experience anyway, are usually trying to discredit serious analyses of uh, uh, of fascism by essentially tarring it with the same brush as name calling. I have no doubt that name calling has has its place in our time, and I have no no difficulty with calling some people fascist, even if they may not necessarily conform to any definition. But the fact of the matter is that uh, there is serious analysis, which is absolutely cannot be reduced to such name calling. Toscano then says that the analysts of fascism today should not give in to the principal temptation. Uh, and I'm, I'll am i be quoting him a lot here. It, it's difficult to indicate quotations, but I'll try to do so. But the principal temptation in his words of historical analogy, because a classical, he puts in quotation, Marx fascist fixes so intimately bound to the capitalist crisis of their time, but also to an era of mass manual labor, universal male conscription for total warfare, and racial imperialist projects are out of time. I mean, tell the people of Palestine that racial imperialist projects are out, uh, out of time. I mean, this is, but this is what we, we read in these very learned uh, 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 treatments of the subject. In any case, um, on the one hand, Toscano says we should not engage in historical analogy, but these assertions are themselves based on comparisons and efforts to see similarities and differences. Um, then to and Toscano makes his historical case against historical analogy with the claim that today capital is not, and this is a quotation, is not running en masse towards an exceptional state to counter existential threats to its reproduction. End of, end of quotation. What Toscano does not understand is that the threat to the reproduction of capital to which fascism is a, is a response or can be a response does not have to be a threat of mass working class resistance. It can also be the threat of its own mounting contradictions, which by the way, may also make it sensitive to even milder forms of working class resistance as it returns hysterically fearful of the slightest dent in its profit margins. Uh, Toscano has also tried to loosen the critical nexus between fascism and capitalism with the argument that to the extent that we can speak of fascism today, and this is after he has been speaking of fascism today without qualification. Um, but anyway, he says, to the extent that we can speak of fascism today, it is a fascism uh, largely emptied. And then he says there are important exceptions, but he does not tell us what they are, but a fascism largely emptied of, the, of mass movement and utopia, a fascism that is not reacting to the imminent threat of revolutionary politics, but which retains the racial fantasy of national rebirth and the frantic circulation of pseudo class discourse whatever he means by that, because fascism has always tried to unite nations and peoples and so on. Uh, further, therefore, Toscano argues that fascism today at best amounts to a pseudo insurgency. So are we to understand that fa interwar fascism was a real insurgency, whereas today's fascism are pseudo insurgencies? Would that things were so simple? Because Toscano adds the caveat that a pseudo insurgency was in many ways what the murderous fascism of Europe's interwar period always incarnated. 
So we see that, uh, again, uh, Toscano is violating his own injunctions against historical analogy. Meanwhile, the fact that the difference he's trying to posit turns out to be no difference at all goes without comment on his part. Toscano then deals with the fundamental Marxist insight into fascism's material basis in capitalism with claims that today fascism has acquired fantastical and superstructural characteristics, which, in his words, warrant expanding one's focus beyond capital strategies to shore up its social dominations under conditions of crisis. So if we are no longer discussing capitalism's material reproduction and crises, then what is the task? Of uh, 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 what, 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 how should we analyze a capitalism and uh, sorry fascism and oppose it? So for him, the chief task in opposing fascism lies in diagnosing the ways in which fascist movements capture, divert, and regiment surplus social energies, etc. So essentially. Uh, uh, he is driving the discussion towards cultural characteristics, psychological characteristics of fascism, and distinctly away from the relation between fascism and capitalism and its crises. Then he sets about three ways in which uh, 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 the fascism today is supposed to be different and superstructural and fantastical. The first is, uh, the, in the first case, he refers to uh, uh, Ernest Bloch's heritage of our times uh, and invokes Bloch's conception of non contemporaneity which is essentially the coexistence of things which we would normally expect to be varied in, in, in very distant in time. So, uh, uh, Bloch's notion of non-contemporaneity is invoked by him, and also how the monop uh, uh, to quote Bloch, how the monopoly capitalist upper class utilizes Gothic dreams against proletarian realities. So the idea is that there's an appeal to some distant past, which is then made uh, 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 made into an inst mobilizational instrument in today's realities. Today, however, according to Toscano, there are two major differences from this form of classic fascism. First, Toscano claims that the political strategy of the proletariat must perforce be synchronous if it is to confront the capitalist now or the present structure, this present situation. The implication is that the proletariat cannot appeal to past dreams of equality and community to build socialism, which in fact is complete nonsense. Secondly, Toscano claims that the proletariat has no Gothic or bucolic dreams, you know, some dreams of a peasant past or anything like that, as Bloch suggests. And therefore, the swindle of fulfillment, that is fascism, uh, 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 which exploits the reactivated, unfulfilled pasts and unrealized futures is not possible today. To assert this, however, Toscano must take theories of postmodernism and postmodernity at face value, rather than understanding them as products of that brief window of time when ne the neoliberal prosperity of the middle classes and the professional middle classes had made it possible for them to imagine that uh, neoliberalism had successfully led to the draining of cultural and temporal difference from the lived experience of the advanced economies. What Jamieson had called schizophrenia and created a postmodern, one dimensional or administered society defined above all by the waning of historicity. However, Toscano should know by now that that postmodernism, know by now at least that postmodernisms and postmodernity's announcement of the end of history, which was not so different from Fukuyama's, which came a decade later, was nothing but wishful thinking. History marches on, including the history of capitalism towards new and ever more macabre forms of decay and deformation. In this context, the fact that the past, which today's fascism, particularly in Western countries refers to is that of the Fordist heyday of big capital and big labor. Uh, 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 this, this, this is not, uh, as, as, as uh, Nos uh, Toscano would, would say, uh, nostalgia for synchronicity, that is to say, it's nostalgia for not something in the past, but something in the present. Uh, it is, in fact, simply nostalgia. It is the nostalgia of a later version of fascism, and there's nothing more to it than that. There is a second point of difference uh, in which, again, um, 
uh, uh, Toscano makes a lot of song and dance about the ideas of Georges Bataille and his ideas of manipulating heterogeneity, which is essentially what is incommensurate with the systematic self-reproduction of the capitalist order, whether it takes the form uh, of, uh, 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 of emerging from below as mass access, whether it emerges from above as unaccountable sovereignty, or uh, uh, emerges from beyond a sacred experience. But after all these rather enticing theoretical formulations, what Toscano really has to say boils down to his rather mundane claim that, that today's fascisms are not really uh, mass movements uh, and therefore their dynamics are different. But even this position is questionable. After all, interwar fascism also eliminated its mass character and became an elite force upon taking power. For example, as when the SS was wound up and replaced by the more elite SA as its striking force in Nazi Germany. And finally, with these two misses, does Toscano, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, hit, score a hit with the third difference? In fact, he hardly even swings. The third point of difference uh, that Toscano seeks to establish ends up being no difference at all. Toscano explores the mass psychology of fascism, referring to the libidinal bond between the narcissistic leader and his followers, to the, to the need for the identification between the follower and the leader to involve both a, a, a leader who is sort of elevated on a pedestal, but at the same time, like the followers, the little great man, etc. All these discussions, which take up quite a few pages, are only end with an acknowledgement that this is exactly the sort of relationship between leaders and followers you see in contemporary fascism. So what is the purpose of writing this, this, this 200 uh, page book about, uh, uh, about fascism and, and trying to establish some quintessential difference between fascism then and now? Toscano's real claim, I would argue, is to discredit class politics. And there's a lot more here we could argue, uh, talk about, but essentially he basically says that anyone who talks about class is talking about the white working class, and this is not acceptable, and therefore we are not to talk about class. So fascism, already rendered spectral and superstructural by Toscano, can now only be opposed by equally spectral and superstructural theories like his own, all existing uh, 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 but even this word is necessary. Class politics is fascism. And then he has long disquisitions about how class politics has discredited itself uh, by, its by its racialization, by its friendliness towards empire and so on. So with this sort of discourse, all genuinely left politics can be branded as fascist, much as his colleagues already brand it as populist. And these words are often inter uh, interchangeable with one another uh, be because there's a huge discourse about how there is a right fascism, uh, sorry, right populism and a left populism, and they are equally dangerous. Such tropes have been used, uh, are precisely have been used against left figures like Corbyn, who have managed to emerge despite the best efforts of the professional middle classes for whom Toscano speaks. So to conclude, then, uh, uh, interventions such as these, such as late fascism, uh, constitute a lesson in how we must all stop worrying and learn to love, if not fascism, at least our alleged impotence against it. This is essentially the message of Toscano. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Radhika, for that very um, useful and erudite discussion of Alberto Toscana and the alternative theories of fascism, which we do have to contend with. So my next speaker, I'm very pleased to say, is Jacques Poel, and he has taught European history at a number of universities in Ontario, and that includes York, Waterloo and Guelph. He is the author of The Great Class War, 1914 to 1918, Big Business, and Hitler and the Myth of the Good War, Revisionist Histories of the Rise of Fascism and the World Wars. His books are read around the world and have been published in French, Italian, Spanish, German, Dutch, Russian, Turkish, and Korean. An independent scholar, Powers holds PhD in history from York, as well as political science, from the U of T. He lives in Brantford, 
Ontario. Thank you, Jacques. Over to you. Is Jacques here? Yes. Uh, Jacques, please go ahead. Please yes. go ahead. Okay, you hear me now, right? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much, Alan, for your kind comments, and thanks for to all of you for inviting me to be part of this panel. I would like to make some remarks about something that doesn't exist. Well, at least doesn't exist according to Wikipedia, and uh, because there's no entry in Wikipedia about this phenomenon. And this phenomenon is important because it's the kind of a, the shadow of fascism, and it's called philo-fascism. Uh, philo-fascism is a term of Greek origin, of course, like philosophy, philos is friend of, and sophia is wisdom, so the philosophers are the friends of wisdom, of knowledge. So philo-fascism means the friends of fascism, you know, people who are who like fascism, uh, the way that scholars or some people like, like knowledge. And uh, philosophy or philo-fascism then is not mentioned by Wikipedia because it's a dangerous concept. It's something that in a sense, they prefer would not exist, or at least they don't want you to know that it exists. On the other hand, for those of us who are want to look critically at fascism, it's very good to know what it means, because it means this. It means focus on the people who actually like fascism, who sponsored fascism, who enabled fascist regimes, who manipulated fascist regimes, and essentially who ended up being the major beneficiaries of fascist regimes. But they are not fascists themselves. And that is very important. In fact, we on the left all too quickly call somebody a fascist when in fact, they're not fascists. They can prove it, so to speak, but they are definitely philo-fascists. In fact, you could argue that philo-fascists are more dangerous in a way than the fascists themselves. So I wanna talk about these people and hopefully someday there may be a, <laughs> an article on Wikipedia about them, or someday maybe somebody has to write a book or an, a long article about philofascism. Philofascists typically are people with money and power. So it's people of wealth and influence who can actually are in a position who are able to take advantage of a movement like fascism. And I will not get involved here now in, in, in my personal views about the origins of fascism and the nature of fascism, but most of us have a pretty good idea what it means. Some theories seem to be pretty convoluted, like the ones that Radhika just mentioned there. So uh, I'm, I'm more in favor of conventional explanations. But um, let's, I wanna stay with my topic of philo-fascism. So philo-fascism is, the philo-fascists are the people who actually have supported fascist movements, helped to, create, to bring them to power, and have taken advantage of their crimes in their wars, and that is very important. These people then are typically the upper class, the elite of a society, you know, the few, as we would say, as opposed to the many, and the 1%, as they sometimes say now, as opposed to the 99%. They are people who are not only the bankers and industrialists and capitalists, okay? We have to understand that. They're not only those bourgeois types, they also include members of the old elites, meaning the old former landowning aristocracy, uh, the church, Catholic as well as other Protestant churches or the Orthodox church elsewhere. They include also the higher ranking military. They include, they include those kinds of people as well. And they include, for example, the, when I mentioned aristocracies, the monarchies in most countries in Europe. We know, for example, just the other day, I saw on television a documentary about the Duke of Windsor who became King Edward VIII for a, few, a very few months only, I guess, in the 1930s, who was a notorious philo-fascist. He was, admired Hitler, and the documentary that I saw just a few days ago on TV focused on his personality and blamed him specifically as an individual for being a philo-fascist. What the documentary, of course, does not mention is that most monarchs, in fact, liked fascism were philo-fascists in the 1920s and 30s, you know, as soon as after the rise of fascism in the wake of the First World War and the Russian Revolution. I can give you other examples. The King of Italy basically had nothing against Mussolini coming to power and ruling dictatorially, and he remained king, and he was very happy with that, much happier than he was with a democratic system. 
And the Italian people knew it. And that's one of the reasons why after the war, they basically voted the, the, the monarchs out of Italy and Italy became a republic. And I'm from Belgium myself. And it is a known fact that King Leopold III in 1940 capitulated when the Belgian army was still putting up resistance and afterwards basically negotiated with Hitler to make sure that there would be a room for a monarch in Belgium and in, uh, in German dominated Europe after the war, which he expected Hitler to win and was probably happy if Hitler would have won. Because monarchs, contrary to what many of us seem to think, are not Democrats. I mean, the elites in our societies whether it's the, the monarchs, the, 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 the church leaders, you know, they prefer actually the old system when there was no democracy. And this is really why then, why, the, why they flirted with and liked fascism when it popped up, when it appeared on this historic scene in the end, at the end of the First World War and in the wake of the Russian Revolution. Fascism, fascism, them had the promise of, of achieving something or made it possible to achieve something that they were really, or to achieve objectives that they were really concerned with ever since before the First World War already. And that was namely the fact that they were worried about the rise of democracy and about the threat of revo the, the specter of revolution. I mean, both the old elites as well as the bourgeoisie had been shocked by a number of revolutions in the first in, in the 19th century, well, already in the late 18th century, of course, 1789, 1830, 1848, especially, and then 1871, the Paris Commune. And after that, socialist parties throughout Europe had adopted, had embraced revolutionary socialism and kept talking about the revolution. And at the same time, there were demands emanating from labor unions and from socialist and social democratic parties for reforms, for concessions, for widening of the franchise. And as a result of that, the elites, the upper classes throughout Europe were really, really concerned in a big way and were looking for, to use that term, a final solution to that problem. And as I write in my book on the First World War, the Great Class War, that war was actually a major anti-democratic and anti-revolutionary project. But it backfired, and it's an irony of history that that war actually produced a Russian, the Russian Revolution and revolutionary situations elsewhere, as well as the need to make major democratic concessions, such as the introduction of universal suffrage in other countries, to defuse potentially revolutionary situations. And that was, of course, a major problem. That meant that after the First World War, the European elites, rather than having less democracy, as they had hoped to something that they had hoped to achieve by means of the war and away with the revolution idea they had more democracy and the revolution had become by well, the word of the revolution had become you had become a reality so to speak you had become flesh in the in the in, in the form of the of the, the of revolutionary russia eventually to become the soviet union so that is the context in which these elites then start to look at a new system that uh, appeared and i will not try to explain now how fascism basically was a product of the First World War. I'll get sidetracked too much, but we all know that, this, that fascism then offered itself as an instrument, you might say, as a weapon, you know, as a means of undoing the democratic concessions that had been made and of once again somehow doing away with the specter of revolution, which was now incarnated by communist parties in Europe and by the existence of the Soviet Union, which was a model, a source of inspiration. So this is where now where, where fascism becomes in really, really of interest you know, to the elites. And Radhika, I think you mentioned earlier how, how the elites have other ways of achieving their objectives and, and weapons and means, for example, the old armies and the, the police, you might say. But the advantage of the Nazi movements was that it seemed to emanate from down below, you know, the fascism itself, as opposed to the philo fascists who are upper class, who are patrician, who are belong to the few, the, the, the fascist parties somehow managed to drum up some popular support. They were plebeian, you might say, you know, they weren't really working class. They were mostly petty bourgeois, to put it that way. Think of a Hitler, for example, Mussolini, they were petty bourgeois types, but they, they somehow had an appeal. They could speak to the 
ordinary people the way that generals and the traditional politicians couldn't. So as the traditional tools of the aristocracy, of the elite were no longer as effective as in the past, you know, fascism seemed to be a more modern, a more you know, popular way, a populist way, I should say, of, of achieving the objectives of the, of, the, of the elite. So actually fascism seemed, was a sort of a plebeian instrument in the hands of the, of the elite to achieve their purposes. And as a result of that, as soon as the elites in Europe became aware of the potential of fascist organizations, they started to support them. And it supported them, you know, first of all, with money. It is a known fact that at a very early stage already, people like Hitler received money from big businesses, individuals, you know, as well as corporations. And one individual, for example, and I'm not even talking about German one, but a, a, an American individual, very wealthy man who gave who supported Hitler at an early stage was Henry Ford. You know? And there was money coming in for to support Hitler already in the early 20s from corporations and banks in Switzerland, for example. You know? And of course, in Germany itself, you know, it's famously there was the great um, um, steel magnate Thyssen, who wrote, afterwards wrote the book and admitted that he had financed Hitler at an early stage already. So they they financed Hitler and they financed they, they allowed him, they allowed this small party and small parties, fascist parties were small in the beginning to have electoral successes because as, as uh, Luciano Canfora, another great Italian scholar, we all, we all know Domenico Lucerdo, but Luciano Canfora is worth looking into as well. He has written a classic book on, on well, I would call it classic, on democracy. He argues, and rightly so, I think, that in the 20th century, elections you know, have to be fabricated. That is to say, mass produced or produced in industrial way by means of big investments, investments of money and time that you know, if you don't have money, you can win elections. We all know that. You have to be a millionaire pretty well these days to, 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 be, to be a candidate or to win an election. So it was that kind of money that provided by bankers and industrialists that allowed the likes of Hitler and Mussolini to achieve a certain amount of electoral successes, which without that, they, that support, they would never have had. But more important than that, these electoral victories were never big enough for any fascist to win a majority. Uh, there had to be also other ways of basic, of making it possible for a fascist movement to actually come to power. And that, for example, in Italy involved Mussolini, the first fascist to come to power as early as 1922, via a so-called March on Rome, which is first presented later on as basically Hitler, uh, sorry, Mussolini and his followers coming to power because of their own volition. Now, we now know that this is all, all basically a charade that was all set up with the help of the monarchy, of the great industrialists, the great landowners, and the Vatican, and all these people who had an interest, you know, who saw the potential of fascism, of a fascist movement becoming a fascist regime, to further their own interests. And we also know that Hitler did not become Chancellor of Germany after a major electoral victory, but to the contrary, he became, actually was invited to become Chancellor after an electoral defeat. Not still a major party, mind you, still has quite a few votes, but after he had suffered a setback electorally, that's when he was invited, because that's when the powers that be, the elites realized that if we don't bring him in now, it may be too late later on. So it was again through intrigue by powerful people behind the screens, and that involved bankers like Mr. Schroeder from, from, um, from Cologne, you know, and Schacht and all these people behind the scenes who basically created fascist systems. So the philo fascists in many ways were the people that, it was the enablers to put it that way, of fascist regimes. And I can think you can pretty well say the same thing about other fascist regimes that were established elsewhere. But the ones that I'm most familiar with, of course, are the ones in Germany and in Italy. Now, they, the fascists come to power thanks to the philo fascists. And once the fascists are in power, because fascism is not only a movement, it's also a regime, it's also an ideology, I'll talk about that later. Once it's in power, the fascist regimes, like that of Mussolini and like that of Hitler, are very, very useful for the philo fascists of the upper class because they do exactly what the, what the upper class wants. And I will focus here on 
not on the all the elites what they got out of fascist regimes. For example, it is well. I'll just mention briefly the example of the Catholic Church that got a lot of benefits out of helping Mussolini to power, because the Italian state before Mussolini was actually an anti-clerical state. It was the product of a war of independence of which the Pope had been the victim. As you may know that, you may not. But Mussolini made a deal, and actually the Pope got his reward for supporting Mussolini. And out of that came all kinds of laws that Mussolini promulgated, like, for example, no more, no more divorce for women. That's just one example. No abortions. The Catholic Church got a big role again in education, which they had not had in Italy until that time. So there were certainly a lot of advantage, advantages for the old elites, such as the church. I focus, I like to focus on the role of capitalists and what capitalists, bankers and industrialists got out of their, of supporting uh, not, um, fascists, including Nazi regimes. As I have written a book about that called Big Business and Hitler, as you may know. But what they got out of it was, first of all, you know, uh, the, not the fascist regimes were a wonderful weapon to wage class struggle. Class struggle, you know, on behalf of the elite against of the, the few against the many, especially against the labor movement, against socialist parties, communist parties, and even, even people who were in other ways inconvenient. And we all know that, for example, in Germany, when Hitler came to power in 1933, one of the first things he did was basically to outlaw the communist party, basically fold the social democrats, basically eliminate all political parties. But first of all, first of all, the communists who represented revolution. So that was the elimination of that, of that revolutionary specter that they were so worried about, the elites. And you may also know that the first concentration camps were established you know, to accommodate the many prisoners who were essentially mostly communists. Uh, too many people assumed too readily that the concentration camps were set up by Hitler you know, for the Jews, and that is not true. Uh, the Jews would have their turn, don't get me wrong. You know, but the first camps were set up because the prisons were so chock a block full with socialists and communists, especially, that they needed extra you know, accommodations. And that was the concentration camps. The first one, the prototype, being the one at Dachau uh, near Munich. So that is what happened right there. So the, 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 the class enemy, so to speak, that had been a threat and a nuisance you know, for, the, for, for capitalism was immediately eliminated. And of course, fascists elsewhere would do the same thing. And by the way, I believe that Zelensky has recently basically outlawed most labor unions, hasn't he? Because the labor unions also were eliminated, of course, by Hitler. And that was, that was fantastic because it, labor, it, it lowered the labor costs for industrialists in Germany quite, quite big, big time, you might say. And not only in Germany, by the way, not only for the German corporations, but you may or may not know that American corporations had made major investments in Germany and uh, their, their, their establishments, their foreign investments in Germany also did very well. Thanks to Hitler. Thank you very much. So the fascist regimes were useful to capitalists and to the elite in general because they basically they eliminated or they helped them fight the class enemy successfully so. In fact, they eliminate, might say, that problem. But even more importantly, one of the big concerns of capitalists, of course, is capital accumulation. That's what it's all about, right? making money. And making money for capitalists in the 20th century, uh, or capitalism in the 20th century, is, is capitalism in its, in its imperialist manifestation. Right? So to make money, big enough profits, to achieve big enough profits, it can't just be done in your own country. You have to basically Go, go across your borders and expand. That's what imperialism is all about. Well, in that respect, too, fascism was extremely useful because it was mentioned earlier already. I think, Radika, you mentioned that, or maybe it was Gabriel who mentioned it, that, for example, under, under Mussolini, right away, Italy became active you know, in, in the imperialist field by expansion into Africa, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, Libya, you name it, right? And that, of course, meant that the fascist regimes have the weapons and that's good for business. And that means to buy these weapons, they have to borrow money from the banks and that's good for the banks because the banks charge high interest rates. You know, later on, the will claim that, that Hitler was and, and Mussolini controlled everything. But in reality, you know, the banks were much in control because they could impose pretty hefty interest rates on the loans they extended to the likes of Mussolini and to Hitler. And, these 
this conquest, this imperialist conquest, then this rearmament that is involved and the militarization of society in general, that is also part and parcel of the fascist phenomenon, you know, that brought in a lot of money for the industrialists who, and for even people who produce, produce uniforms like, like, like Hugo Boss, for example, who, who made uniforms for the SS in Germany, as you may know, fortunes were made. But of course, the problem was also, where does the money gonna come from? Hitler had to borrow money from, these, uh, from the banks to pay the industrialists. So the bankers are happy, the industrialists are happy, but excuse me, Mr. Hitler, Excuse me, Mr. Mussolini, how are you going to pay back your loans? And there the answer is war, you know, war, a great war, which this time we're going to win, not like in 1914, 18, you know, because we have, you know, now have the best weapons we just bought, you know, with the money we borrowed from the banks. And the way we're going to pay back is basically through conquest. The wars we're going to fight are going to be wars of rapine, you know, wars of conquest. And as Caesar already said, and the Romans said, ve victis, the losers will pay, you know. And that was indeed the case in, many, in, in, in the Second World War, for example. One of the advantages for Hitler to overrunning little Belgium, where I'm from, was that all the gold of the, Bel the Bank, National Bank of Belgium, quite a bit of it actually, most of it coming from the Congo, was flipped over to, to Germany. And so, so wars of rapine like that helped to pay the, pay the banks, the loans back. So that was very, very important. So that was one of the, um, the big advantages that, that, that Hitler, that fascism, offered to the feudal fascists. That is one of the big reasons why these gentlemen, these most hardly any ladies in those days, still mostly gentlemen, you know, liked fascism a lot, were philo fascists because they had invested in fascism and the returns on investment in fascism were absolutely huge. And we know that the profits in Germany of, cor of, of corporations in Germany and of banks in Germany and of the American corporations active in Germany skyrocketed in the 1930s already you know, because of the rearmament program of Hitler. And by the way, the profits made by the oil barons who sold the, the petroleum, which Hitler's tanks and airplanes would need to wage a war, you know, they made sky high profits as well. You know. By the way, for, Germ for German industry, the idea that, that Hitler would have to fight a war to basically pay back, you know, the banks and therefore, you know, keep, keep the system going, that this would have to be through a war of rapine, you know, was not a concern at all. And not, neither was it a concern for the, the owners of American corporations in Germany, which included Henry Ford, by the way, you know, because it was quite obvious in the beginning that the war Hitler was going to fight was a war against the Soviet Union. And that, of course, meant that this gentleman, you know, who, who allows us to make fantastic money is only going to do the dirty work, which we ourselves would love to do, but can for some reason, he's going to destroy the Soviet Union, the hotbed of revolution, you know, the revolution incarnate, you know. And this is one of the, was one of the main concerns that I mentioned already before the First World War, uh, and even bigger, a bigger concern after the First World War, you know, how to get rid of this specter of the revolution, how to get rid of the Soviet Union. So for the German industrialists, who love the idea of the Soviet Union being wiped out. And for the American industrialists with investments in Germany, who also love the idea of that country that was the source of inspiration for their Reds in the 30s, of which there were many in the States, you know, that that country would be wiped out by this wonderful Nazi, by this wonderful fascist leader that we brought to power, that we enabled, who's the regime we enabled. That was not only really wonderful, but it was to be complemented by the conquest of an in India or a Wild West, to use the, the names of the places which inspired of the conquests by the British and by the Americans that had inspired Hitler's desire to, to go east and conquer basically in India for Germany in Eastern Europe. In fact, the German industry spoke sorry, about how, sorry, how it would be in, in sorry. Wait, wait, I'm trying to, this is wonderful. I'm trying to make sure there is room for the other two speakers. Yeah. Well, I'm going to stop that pretty quickly. Anyways, the idea for the German industry was that this would be an Ergänzungsgebiet, like a complementary sort of colony for the heavily industrialized German heartland. And that would then give to Germany the raw materials, like the petroleum that it needed, and the very rich agricultural land of Ukraine. And if you think about that, even today, you know, Germany is heavily involved in a crisis in Ukraine, and you bet that they're also interested in the, the land over there, which Zelensky is selling off for very little money, of course, for big agri-businesses to acquire. 
So this is one of the, these were the things that were very, very useful uh, that made fascism useful for the people up there who therefore liked fascism became philo fascists. But I wanna make a finish off here then. One of the wonderful advantages of the system was that the philo fascists rarely ever became fascists themselves. Most of them never joined the party. You know, most of them were never seen in any uniform. There were some exceptions, of course. You know, we, we can focus on those, but we, there's no need to do that. So most of them never, never, never touched it. So that allowed these people, these people, these industrialists, these bankers, the church to say after the war, after all the misery, after the wars, it wasn't us. It was them. You know, plausible deniability is very, very, very important. Better still. Not only could you say it wasn't us, it was the fascists. The fascists, these plebeian types, they could call themselves socialists, revolutionaries, anti-capitalists. Yes, it was their fault. They're guilty of all these things. And we, we just followed orders. We had no power. You know, we just had to do because Hitler was so powerful, you know, and hit Mussolini, same thing. We could do nothing. We had to follow orders. He, he forced us to produce weapons. You know, a bit of money in the process, fair enough, but I mean, it wasn't us, right? And it was in fact socialism. Even today, as you may know, a lot of people still think that Hitler's national socialism was a socialism. In fact, it's just a label, it meant nothing, you know, it was used for electoral purposes. But that is one of the advantages, you know, of fascism for the philo fascists, that they didn't have to do the dirty work themselves. Somebody else did it for them, and they can point a finger at them later on at the others and say, it wasn't us. In fact, it was ordinary people who brought Hitler to power, ordinary people who did what committed the crimes, not us, we don't get involved in that. So this is actually my comments about philo fascism and, and uh, I'll leave it up to you to think about how today when fascism is indeed making a comeback, who the philo fascists are, you know, and how they benefit from that. You know? That is something that, as an historian, who, I'm not, I don't have much expertise in that, but some of you follow very closely what's going on, what has been going on in Ukraine, in Israel, in the third world in general, and wherever fascism rears its ugly head, the question to be asked is, who are the philo fascists? Maybe someday there'll be an article in Wikipedia. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> On our, shell, on our shelves is a book that was in my father's possession. He fought on the front line in, in, in Hamburg in the war when the surrender of the Germans occurred, called I Paid Hitler by a man called Thyssen. Yes, I mentioned him. Yes, Thyssen, yes. And, but he, he, we have that book. Um, he also said that in the, when, after the German surrender, the officers of the British and the, the high officers of the British and the Germans were working together all the time discussing uh, basically how they could jointly deal with the Jewish menace. And he went up on a tower to watch the surrender of the to witness the celebrations with the Jewish partisan. And he was nearly court martialed for fraternizing with the enemy. Yeah, really. So, you know, there are two stories there and there are two classes, and I wish we could have heard more. One of the things that we are discussing, I've heard, is that we might try and produce a small work, a book or something like that, based on the contributions to this seminar. And I think that would be a wonderful idea. But anyway, next I have to go to, I, I'm very happy to go to our next speaker, Jennifer Ponce de Leon. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. And she is an interdisciplinary scholar whose research focuses on 20th and 21st century left movements and cultural production in the Americas and Marxist anti-colonial and post-colonial thought. She works across studies of visual arts, literature and performance on traditional Latinx and Latin American studies and critical theory. She's also fa faculty in Latin America and Latinx studies, LALS, affiliated faculty in gender, sexuality and women's studies and cinema studies, and a member of the graduate group in comparative literature. She was the recipient of the 2020 SAS Dean's Award for Distinguished Teaching by an Assistant Professor. She is Associate Director of the Critical Theory Workshop, Atelier de Théorie Critique, which holds an intensive summer research program at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris every summer, which was publicized earlier by Gabriel, as well as symposia 
in the University of Pennsylvania. So it gives me great pleasure to invite Jennifer to make the next contribution. Thank you very much, Alan. I'm um, very honored to be part of this panel with people I admire and from whom I've learned so much. I'm very grateful to the organizers, my fellow panelists, and those of you who are watching uh, or listening. So I'm going to be building on much of what has been said, particularly the point that fascism operates as the cutting edge of, the, of imperialism and as a permutation within capitalism's colonial tradition. And I'm going to be talking about some of the ways this has manifested itself in the case of US imperialism. I've written about this in American Quarterly, where I argue that fascistic modes of governance have been integral and systemic features of US elites class warfare, particularly as this, has is, as this is exercised on the country's colonized and neo-colonized populations. And this includes persons in other countries, as well as internally colonized people and neo-colonized immigrant workers residing within the US. And when in the 1960s and 70s, revolutionary Marxists like George Jackson, Kathleen Cleaver, and Angela Davis analyzed what they considered to be the fascist or proto-fascist character of the United States, they cited evidence for this in the state's racist and political repression, its anti-labor orientation, its enormous pre prison system and secret police force, and in its demonstrated support of the most fascist and racist regimes throughout the world. In a speech she gave in 1973 on the fascist seed within US imperialism, Angela Davis asked, is it not possible to say that a ruling class so willing to support fascism abroad will not find, will find, it, will not find it difficult to resort to fascist tactics at home, especially if it is a question of rescuing themselves and their profits? Now, Jackson argued that the US had already become the prototype of the international fascist counter-revolution. Um, Curry Mallet has critiqued this Jackson's lack of appreciation for the important difference between a liberal state with fascistic practices and a state that eliminates all bourgeois democratic rights. And this distinction is, of course, absolutely crucial. But at the same time, we also must be able to see that these fascistic practices that Jackson and Davis were talking about are systemic, institutionalized, and rooted in the political economy of US capitalism and imperialism. And we also have to be able to see that the exercise of U.S. imperialism has historically entailed the denial of bourgeois democratic rights, as well as basic human rights, to people around the world. We are seeing this happen in real time in Palestine, and we have seen this in the funding and training of anti-communist dictators, police forces, and death squads across the third world. So I'm going to talk briefly about this history in Latin America and the Caribbean being schematic out of necessity. Now, in the wake of the Mexican and Bolshevik revolutions, the region saw a wave of progressive and revolutionary gov governments come to power, bringing democratization, in some cases land reform, and efforts at national development to break out of their economy's conditions of dependency and underdevelopment. The success of the Cuban revolution catalyzed the spread of armed revolutionary movements across the region. Now, given the degree to which US imperialism had dominated Latin America and the Caribbean economically and militarily since the 19th century, all of these progressive movements, both reformist and revolutionary, were all struggles for national self-determination against US imperialism. And this was occurring in the context where the growth of socialism around the world took about a third of this population out of the orbit of US-led imperialism, which itself entered into a cyclical crisis in the early 1970s. So what follows um, on the part of, of both local Latin American and US elites is what is aptly described by, by Domenico Lacerdo as a neo-colonial, neoliberal counter-revolution. In Latin America, um, the US state and particularly the CIA worked with local comprador elites to overthrow leftist governments throughout Latin America and the Caribbean and put in their place military dictatorships friendly to the US Capitol and the Pentagon. With US support, these regimes dissolved democratic institutions, suspended rights, organized death squads, and extrajudicially kidnapped, tortured, and assassinated hundreds of thousands of people while forcing many more into exile. In addition to terrorism, they also use their state's legal mechanisms in their attempts to not simply destroy revolutionary communist movements, but also to break the power of organized labor, roll back gains workers had already achieved, and preempt opposition to the sweeping macroeconomic and policy reforms that they imposed by fiat including trade liberalization, financialization, concessions to foreign capitalists, anti-worker reforms to labor law, and so forth. 
Now, these US root back regimes were at the time and have been understood by many to be fascist. Others have classified them as authoritarian. The distinction is made around the degree to which they relied principally on an expanding repressive apparatus of the state associated with authoritarianism versus a degree to which they had support from sectors of civil society associated with fascism. Now, as Andre, Andre Gunder Frank argued, this distinction mattered for acknowledging that these military regimes ultimately responded to the dictates of foreign capital at the expense of their national populations, so they could not drum up significant support from the latter. Nonetheless, such regimes did have the support of local capitalists who benefited enormously from, enormously from their brutal assaults on labor. They also often had support drummed up for them by the church. And it is also the case that these regimes engaged in extensive propaganda to legitimate themselves with civil society, often by fabricating fears of a savage, savagely violent, atheist, immoral, totalitarian communist threat against which they were supposedly defending their people. And what these regimes shared with every other fascist force in the world was their virulent anti-communism, antipathy to democracy, alignment with the interests of capital and imperialism, and their use of violent and repressive means to overcome the power of workers and peasants um, and to attempt to destroy any seeds of socialism. Now, the savagery of their violence has been understood by many legal authorities to constitute crimes against humanity, and in some cases, genocide. And in places where indigenous people constituted a large part of the popular classes, this political violence had a distinctly racist and colonial character. Um, scorched earth tactics used on peasant villages were also um, used as means to dispossess peasants of their lands. Now, the US state, often through the CIA, supported this violence in myriad ways, from arming and training death squads, educating them in torture and terrorism, and providing international coordination among these different regimes. Israel was also instrumental in supplying arms and training. French officers disseminated techniques they had learned in their colonial war on Algerians. And this transnational network that brought state terrorism to Latin American workers also included bona fide Nazi officers like Klaus Barbie, who the US sent to Bolivia to shelter him from prosecution in Europe. Now, Latin American states transition to liberal constitutional regimes in the 80s and 90s illustrate what Gramsci analyzed as the perfect division of labor between fascism and democracy. Gramsci argued that ruling classes use fascism to destroy the organizational, organizational edifice and centers of organic unity of the working class and sow terror among the people. Once the strength of peasants and workers has been rendered ineffective, democratic institutions can be rehabilitated. In such conditions, Gramsci wrote, quote, so-called liberal bourgeois groups can, without fear of fatal repercussions on the internal cohesion of state and society, separate their responsibilities from those of the fascism which they armed, encouraged, and incited to struggle against the workers. Indeed, in many cases, democratic neoliberal governments carried forward the same economic policies as their dictatorial predecessors, often under the pressure of IMF and World Bank, who um, you know, use debt to um, force structural adjustment programs on these countries. Now, the effects of these, you know, decades of these neo-colonial neoliberal policies include unprecedented inequality, the massive dispossession of small landholders, the immiseration of workers, economic dependency, and stunted national development, as Latin American countries were essentially made to be suppliers of unprocessed natural resources and cheap labor for foreign markets and corporations. Now, we have, of course, seen important struggles against this neoliberal, neocolonial model, most notably in the Bolivarian Revolution and other ALBA states, the Pink Tide, and subsequent progressive electoral victories. But we have also seen the continued readiness of US and Latin American elites to attempt to quash democratic processes in order to regain power. Though lawfare has become a new favored weapon in their toolbox, they also continue to use familiar means like coups and economic warfare in the form of sanction and blockades that is aimed to promote regime change. And they also are more than willing to su um, support thuggish local leaders who are apologists for or even former functionaries of recent dictatorships. These elites rely on the repression of the popular classes for which the US and Israel continue to provide funding and training. And much of this infrastructure of repression has been built up under the aegis of the um, war on drugs or the war on terrorism. Now, since I'm considering 
fascism's relation to US imperialism. Before closing, I want to turn to one other arena in which this is evidenced, which is the contemporary war on immigrants. Now, US-led economic and military imperialism in Latin America and the Caribbean, whose contours I have very briefly outlined, bears huge responsibility for creating conditions that have caused millions of people to migrate to the US to look for work in order to survive and to ensure the survival of their families. And the US state increasingly governs this transnational reserve army of labor through incarceration, policing, deportation, and well, and also by promoting racialized security ideologies that help to criminalize and dehumanize immigrant workers. Now, despite the ubiquity of anti-immigrant racism in US culture, the country's ruling classes have long relied on federal immigration policy to recruit and control labor that meets their needs, as well as to remove workers when they become superfluous to these needs or potentially destabilizing. Immigration and border policies also organize and enforce rights differentiated and racialized hierarchies among workers. This only, not only divides workers, diminishing our collective power, it also creates group of highly controlled vulnerable workers who lack of rights make them available to more intense exploitation. And this in turn pushes wages down for all workers. Now, historically, guest worker programs have created segregated, segregated groups of workers who are deprived of fundamental civil and political rights. But a similar arrangement is now maintained by the criminalization of immigrants and the socially powerful workforce it provides. Since the 80s, both parties of the US federal government have pursued policies that have expanded the criminalization, deportation, and imprisonment of vast number of immigrants, making immigrant workers imprisoned for unlawful entry the fastest growing sector of the US prison population, and making immigrant prosecutions the largest share of federal prosecutions nationwide. Immigrants are afforded very few of the legal protections citizens have. They are typically denied access to legal representation and tried en masse. And the caging and militarized control of migrants, which is a growth industry worth tens of billions of dollars, is a growing component of the US military prison industrial complex, which not only names a set of institutions, but also a course of economic development and political decision making. Corporations involved in border militarization, detention, and deportation logistics lobby policymakers to push for laws that further criminalize immigrants and expand the use of immigration detention. Justin Akers Chacon has convincingly, has convincingly argued that the repression of immigrants and refugees is a leading edge of international fascism in our current conjuncture, as it is used to build up police states, abet profiteering from repression, and proliferate racist ideologies and parastate violence. Chacon, Mike Davis, and Brendan O'Connor have all written about the symbi symbiotic relationship between fascist and anti-immigrant vigilante organizations, powerful capitalists, and state policymakers. Dubbing this border fascism, O'Connor has mapped the networks of nativist think tanks and militias that push punitive immigration policy, while also exposing their leaders' embrace of fascist and racist ideologies. He also argues that with increased climate change induced migration, we will see ever intensifying criminalization and repression of migrant workers. So I just want to close by underscoring these authors arguments that the repression we see of migrants in the US and around the world is a cutting edge of contemporary fascism that evinces imperialist elites increasing reliance on the increase, excuse me, increasing reliance on the militarized control of workers more generally. Thank you. That was truly wonderful. I'm uh, aware that I've let the speakers go on. I haven't exercised the traditional role of a chair in restricting time because I think it's just been so important to hear everybody. Before we turn, therefore, to our last speaker, and this, this may probably mean that we don't have much time for questions. So I want to make sure that Harry has all the time that he needs for the very important message that we're going to hear from him. I think I want to say one thing, which is what can you do? In moments of great crisis, the individual often feels that she or he is overpowered by enormous forces. Fascism works by means of terror. It terrorizes people into passivity. Actually, at such great moments, the actions of individuals can have an enormous effect. 
individuals are actually empowered. If one looks at the historic heroic resistance of tiny forces, and I think everybody has spoken quite rightly of the horror of what is happening in Gaza, but we also must bear testimony to the heroism of the resistance of the Palestinian people, which shows what is possible. And I think that will triumph in the end. So what can we do? Well, there are two very simple things that one can do. You can protest individual things that are going wrong, and that's the leverage. So I'm going to suggest that everybody should see if they can write to their appropriate representatives about what happened in Nazi-gate in the Canadian Parliament. It's a very simple act. If you're outside Canada, write to the Canadian Embassy. If you're in Canada, write to Trudeau, write to Freeland, write to your MP. Just lobby. It will make a difference. I'll tell you why. Because if no action is taken, that itself is evidence of what we're, de- what we're dealing with, which should be presented to the public. Second, I think we will present this discussion to the public. There's been the idea of producing a book out of it, and I'm sure that we will do that. So if you do have questions that you would like the participants to address, please send them to us, and I'm going to just paste our contact address there so that you can do that. And finally, I would urge you, if you can, to write to the CBC Ombudsman. This is the organisation that re- that regulates CBC, is still, believe it or not, a public services organisation, uh, behaving like an ancillary of the state at this moment, which I suppose it is. But write to the CBC Ombudsman and protest and make sure that you send us a copy. And finally, if you'd like to help us and volunteer for the many things that we're doing to make webinars like this possible, please do contact us. That's all I have to say in concluding um, my remarks, but I now want to invite um, Henry uh, Helmut Lowen. Now, we've known him for some time by living in the same city. Uh, His reputation is justly deserved as a long-standing anti-fascist activist. And what I'd like to do is to make sure that we give a big welcome to Harry and allow him all the time, and I can see all the participants who are with us at the beginning are still here at the end. And I very much hope we'll, we'll, we'll give Harry every chance to, to, to give us his message. So thank you, Helmut Harry Lewin, over to you. Thank you very much, Alan. And thank you to the panelists uh, for their very incisive and inspiring analyses. Everyone on this panel um, it means a great deal to me personally, and also uh, politically and philosophically. I I cannot stress that enough. I'm grateful uh, that I'm able to speak here from the studio of Yaron Walter, who is my longtime comrade of over 30 years in anti-fascist projects. I also wanna thank Paul Graham and Brendan Devlin for their organizational work. Now, I had already finished my presentation when Brendan, after I asked him, sent me his brilliant MA thesis, uh, supervised by Dr. Desai, which deals with 21st century Canadian imperialism. And I urge everyone to get a copy of that from Brendan Devlin. And he wrote to me sharing the following, which I I thought I would include as at the outset of my uh, presentation here. He said that he first became aware of anti-fascism in 2017, Uh, during the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. And he paid close attention to the anti-fascist tactics that were deployed there. And as Brendan writes, quote, as much as I appreciated the militancy and impact of those tactics, I was always taken aback by the sort of normative anarchism that framed a lot of anti-fascist analysis and praxis. That's a very insightful point. And it's borne out by, for example, what happened in Leipzig, Germany, just a few days ago on Tuesday. An Antifa, an anti-fascist group in Leipzig, part of the so-called autonomous anti-authoritarian scene in that city, smashed the windows of an immigrant political organizing space This left-wing space was run by Black immigrants and people of color, and they smashed the windows and, quote, and threw bottles or glass jars of pig fat into the building. And they bragged about this on indie media, an anarchist platform, and basically said, 
we're doing this because you are importing anti-Semitism to Germany. And a few days later, a so-called feminist Antifa group in Leipzig made the same point. The group is called Fantifa. And it warned the left in Germany not to express solidarity with Palestinian uh, people and especially Muslims in Germany. So that is one example of a number of examples which we can use. I refer secondly here to what happened just a few months ago in Berlin when the headquarters of the Marxist newspaper, Junge Welt, Germany's longest standing daily Marxist newspaper founded in 1947, was picketed by anarchists and anti-fascists holding up the Rojava Antifa flag. And they were protesting one of the journalists for Junge Welt, Suzanne Witt-Stahl, who has for at least 12 years documented extensively fascism in Ukraine uh, and the problem with the anti-fascist movement in Germany, which she argues rightly has abandoned its revolutionary traditions and has become a kind of force for neoliberalism. And she documents and argues this extensively. And there are reasons how this occurred. In the late 1990s, for example, the coalition German government of the Social Democrats and the Green Party for the first time adopted a kind of a two-tier strategy. They sent troops for the first time, German troops, into foreign battle since the Second World War. And secondly, the Social Democrats and Greens set up what is called in Germany a Staatsantifa, a state-sponsored anti-fascism. These were strategies meant to defang and neutralize and debilitate the left. This is a process that's ongoing with some of the more recent programs by the Social Democrats, by the Interior Minister uh, Nancy Faeser under her extremism uh, outreach, which tends to conflate so-called left-wing extremism and right-wing extremism. It's a war on the left under the pretext of fighting so-called right-wing extremism. So in one of her books a decade ago, Witt Stahl uh, published a collection which carries a very strange title. Um, Antifa heist Luftangriff. Antifa means air raid. And what that refers to, that odd title, is that among Greens, Social Democrats, and the peace movement in the 1990s, with the war on Serbia, the NATO war, anti-fascism was now defined as supporting NATO bombing raids to dislodge, quote, the Hitler of the Balkans, namely Slobodan Milosevic. So Wittstahl is very good in terms of tracing the degeneration, the decomposition of the German left and the German anti-fascist movement and raises some very difficult questions. On the cultural front, she also showed, for example, and this is quite the obscenity, uh, earlier this year was the 125th anniversary of the birthday of Bertolt Brecht. And who was invited in Brecht's birthplace in Augsburg and at Brecht's theater in Berlin to commemorate these events, but a fascist ensemble called the Dock Daughters, who described themselves as the Daughters of Bandera and who first came into public prominence during the Maidan fascist coup, they're described by one journalist in Germany as the pinup girls for Ukrainian fascism. And so you have fascists, seven women who sort of express a kind of avant-garde of fascism in the cultural sphere. So you have the cultural bourgeoisie, which is predominantly left-wing in Augsburg and Berlin, bringing in fascists to commemorate Bertolt Brecht. It boggles the mind. Philosophically, we can also track some of the developments in academia and in philosophical discourse, which as Radica pointed out with her um, excoriation of Alberto Toscano, there are a number of philosophers um, that we can mention here very briefly. In 1977, for example, Michel Foucault publishes a famous preface to a book by Deleuze and Guattari, uh, 
in which he talks about the non-fascist life, not the anti-fascist life. He says anti-fascism is easy. What's difficult is to cultivate a non-fascist life. And he then talks about the fascist inside all of us, the fascist in our head, the fascist who loves power. Now, as absurd as this sounds to us who come at fascism from a perspective of historical materialism, this is a prominent thesis which has variations in academia and in the activist world. Right? For example, Brad Evans, the philosopher of nonviolence, in his book on Deleuze and uh, fascism, Evans says, before we can start our analysis of fascism, we have to realize that we are all fascists. So the point is we have to extricate the fascist in us. More recently, Jack Bratich, a professor at Rutgers, has published a very popular book called On Microfascism. This is the concept du jour since Foucault and Guattari, microfascism. And he says in this book that the question is not class analysis, what is primordial are patriarchal systems of oppression, right? So <clears throat> feminist and gender analysis, not class analysis. The most odious example of this trend is even more recent. The philosopher Rosie Braidotti, who recently um, retired from Utrecht, she was giving a seminar recently at the European University in Florence at the Max Weber seminar to predominantly postdoctoral students. And this is how Braidotti uh, puts it. She says, for example, that we need to abandon class analysis and the whole tradition of Hegelian negativity. She is proposing a kind of neo spinozism which you also find in Deleuze and Guattari. And she argues, for example, and I'll just make a few quotes here. She says her position is a post-human feminism. She's also associated with the so-called new materialism, which we can talk about uh, at another point. She says that Guattari and Deleuze's book, A Thousand Plateaus, is the philosophical work of the past half century. And this is how she puts it. We need to develop an anti-fascist philosophy, which is, quote, an antidote to the poison of fascism. She says such a philosophy has immunological effects, parasitological effects. Such a philosophy serves us as a detox. She says, we need to recognize the micro-fascist inside of us, quote, that which lulls us to sleep for the fascination of fascism. She says, we need to suspend any talk about actually existing fascism and deal first and foremost with our internal fascism. She then concludes, and it's rather arrogant. She says, my position is a radical position, as if the Marxist and the class-based positions are something else. She says, this is a radical position, but then, and I couldn't make this up, twice she advises her postdoctoral students, but you should be very careful when you address this topic until you get tenure. <laughs> that is how academic opportunists are made by that sort of advice. Rosi Braidotti. So with the focus on the care of the self, to use Foucault's language, these theories, uh, which have their ascendancy under neoliberalism and continue to this day, are one example of how anti-fascism has been removed from what Wittstahl calls its Marxist roots. It's been removed from what Bertolt Brecht uh, advised would be an analysis of fascism, um, which recognizes that fascism is the most brutal, treacherous form of capitalism. There are other theorists, Roger Griffin, the historian, uh, Jason Stanley, right? Uh, Jason Stanley gave a series of lectures in early August at the Kiev School of Economics. They are online. I recommend that you watch these for the uh, completely 
specious approach that Stanley takes to the question of fascism. And it's also quite embarrassing and even cringeworthy when you watch these lectures. There are others. We can look also at the way in which hate crime studies in academia are complicit in distorting our view of fascism. And I'll mention only here um, a, a leading scholar from my discipline in criminology and sociology. Dr. Barbara Perry is perhaps Canada's leading scholar of hate crime. In recognition of her service to the security state, Perry was recently given the UNESCO Chair in Hate Studies at uh, Ontario Tech University. Now we can say a lot about Barbara Perry. She comes across as progressive, but she's very critical of anti-fascist movements, um, uses models of extremism to equate the left and the right. And she said in one interview on uh, CBC a few years ago, uh, after an altercation involving Montreal Antifa, les antifascist uh, in Montreal, she was critical and said, they give us all a bad name, us progressives. She said, they don't represent, quote, the Canadian values we hold dear. Remember, there's an academic talking now. Canadian values we hold dear. She said, extremism is extremism. It's the polar opposite of what characterizes the rest of us. She then agreed with CBC host Michael Serapio when Serapio said in conclusion, quote, the anti-fascist movement discredits progressives just as the alt-right damages conservatives or those who identify as conservative. I can't get into, for reasons of time, the role of foundations and think tanks. But I mentioned here the Canadian Anti-Hate Network, which is the example, a good example of kind of an astroturf organization that was imposed on the activist community. But recently in late November, the Canadian Anti-Hate Network um, co-sponsored what was built an anti-fascist event with the German embassy and the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, a social democratic foundation. And at that event, it featured a number of, of speakers, really no activists, but one of the speakers was Stephanie Carvin, who's a professor in international studies at Carleton. She is widely seen on television talking about security matters. She was described by a military journalist as a, a cheerleader for CSIS, a cheerleader for the security establishment. Carvin also engages in this type of you know, equivalency between the left and the right. But just as a footnote before I go on to my very last point, do a Google search on Stephanie Carvin and the word takes, takes that are baked. She was caught in a scandal when it was discovered that she had a habit of baking takes which featured drones blasting so-called Muslim terrorists, right? These were takes. Now, Stephanie Carvin, before she became a professor, was a consultant to the Department of Defense in the United States on drone warfare. So here she is spreading a kind of Islamophobia by making fun of and giving her friends in academia and in the spy business elaborately decorated cakes, birthday cakes, and cupcakes featuring these symbols. It boggles the mind. Now, in conclusion, Alan, I cannot thank you enough, both for your introductory comments and for um, the comments prefacing my talk. You mentioned Canadian fascism on the home front. And let me conclude here with the following. It's been a scant five weeks since Canadian parliamentarians gave standing ovations to a fascist. It strains credulity to accept what many of the politicians claimed, namely that they knew not who Mr. Honka was. That's nonsense. And I'll give two examples. Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland, a member of parliament for Toronto, and another backbencher from Toronto, Yvonne Baker, are both prominent in terms of um, activism in the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress chapter in Toronto. 
Freeland knows exactly who Honka was. And this might explain why she was so nervous as questions were raised in the house subsequently about who Honka was. Yvonne Baker, a literal backbencher, was moved to the front bench and had the most prominent seat during uh, Zelensky's speech and is prominently shown uh, cheering on Yonka, Honka uh, in the uh, loge. Baker knew exactly who Honka was. Yvonne Baker was on the UCC executive when that organization sponsored three commemoration events, 27, 2012, and 2021, honoring this very division. And Honka was around then, he didn't move to North Bay until later. So we need to learn a lot more and I can only echo Alan's point about putting pressure before this uh, event goes down the memory hole even further. So to conclude, right, in the House of Commons, we often heard the uh, Ukrainian phrase, glory to Ukraine, glory to our heroes in Ukrainian, Slava Ukraini, right? this incantation against that obscenity of glorifying Ukraine, against the historical falsifications that are part of any hero heroization and glorification of Ukrainian fascism, against Holocaust denial, against the rehabilitation of Nazis and their whitewashing of their crimes, now and then, we anti-fascists all invoke a different tradition. We invoke the <clears throat> uh, call, the imperative of the anti-fascist partisans during the Second World War. We invoke the phrase smert fascismu, death to fascism, glory and freedom to the people. Smert fascismu, not slava ukraini. Uh, uh, it was Stepan Filipovich, the courageous communist partisan in Yugoslavia, who at the moment of his execution, when the Nazis had put the noose around his neck, you have this famous picture of him holding up both hands and crying out to the ages, death to fascism. This is our call. Thank you. What a fantastic end. I'm um, reminded of one thing that I've seen. If, like me, you follow every day the broadcasts or reports on what's been happening in the actual battlefront on Ukraine, those of you who've seen that will know that uh, a noose is tightening around the military stronghold of Avdivka, whose borders are on the ring road around Donetsk city. Donetsk, as you know, with Luhansk, is one of the two Russian-speaking republics against which the ire of the Ukrainian fascists is directed. And as we all know also, this is an exterminist, an exterminist attitude. The attitude that you see repeated in uh, many declarations for the government is not that we're going to free the people of Donetsk or Luhansk, we're going to take over the land or we're going to kick out the people. Same with Crimea, which is to say, Four million Russian speakers stand to be chased out or exterminated by the Ukrainians. Now, one of the interesting things is that in the recent conquests of the militias there, we see the Russian flag was planted on the Koch Center, which has overseas Avdivka. Above the Russian flag was the flag of the Soviet Republic. It was actually put there by the Donetsk militias, who are in fact not the Russians, the Donetsk militias playing one of the major roles in the fight against Avdivka. This is hardly surprising. For eight years or more, these people have been submitted to bombardments of their city from Avdivka, from Novomikhailovka nearby, in which they have used completely illegal weapons, petal mines. Petal mines are mines which just sit around looking like leaves, and if you tread on it, blows your leg off. If your pet stands on it, it, it kills your pet. Cluster bombs supplied by the Americans. And in the last week, for the first time, 
the citizens of Donetsk had three days free of bombing. Imagine, for eight years you've been butt shelled every day and for three days. No wonder your militias are fighting the fascists. No wonder the flag of which has the Soviet symbolism on it, the flag of the militia, flies at the top of that. So proletarian internationalism is the way to defeat fascism. So I cannot but echo and repeat um, this stirring conclusion to this. As I say, there are many things that we can do. Um, there is no really serious time for questions, but please, if you have anything you want us to do, I've put several times in the chat, I've put our contact address and the things that you might do. Thank you to all our wonderful speakers and thank you to all our participants. And I leave it to the hosts to end the meeting. I will end the meeting after saying the, uh, saving the transcript, but uh, thanks everyone. And yeah, continue uh, until I, I end, yeah. Okay, saved, bye everyone. <laughs>